Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to be here with you all. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's open our Bible and let's get ready to learn the Word of God this morning. Um, last week, we spoke about being empowered by the calling, being empowered when we answer the call of God. Amen. So we learned last week about the fact that our authority or our strength lies in the fact that we know our identity. Our, our, our authority and power comes from knowing our identity. You know, that's very important and very vital for every single believer in the house of God. Can I have the house light be, you know, bring it all the way up so we can see one another? All right. So our authority and our power comes from the fact that we know who we are. We know who we are. We know our identity. And what is important about our identity, last week I shared with you, is the fact that we know we are called. We are called by God. We have a calling to answer. We have a calling that was issued directly from the throne of God. And, and I, shared with you, um, I shared with you about how our call is divided into two aspects, which is the primary calling, which is to be in a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And also, our secondary calling is to live for Him. You know, to, to, to live, to think, to speak, and to act for Him. You know, again, let me remind you again, the strength of our life would lies in the fact that we know our identity. And what is important to realize about our identity is the fact that we are called by God. Amen? Not one of you are left out without a calling. Every single one of you was designed, was in the thoughts and the mind of God with a purpose, with a design. And it is critical, it is understand that not only you discover that call, you heard that call, but you answer it. Because from as you do that, you know, you will encounter such empowerment that the world can never offer before. Amen? So before we are being called to something, we are being called to someone. Amen? So before we are called to do, we are called to be. Before we are called to something, we are called to someone. And that someone is our Lord and Savior, our God, our Almighty, Jesus Christ Himself. Amen? So I want to share with you this morning something that is connected to that. But it is more personal because today we are celebrating a great day. We're celebrating Mother's Day. Amen? Let's give a round of applause to the mothers in this house. And also, we are mindful of all of our mothers wherever they may be, you know. Because um, where would we be without our mother? Amen? So this morning, I want to share with you a message that is personal to me. And I titled this, Mothers Who Said Yes. All right? Mothers who said yes. You know, but contrary to popular belief, you know, it's not the kind of mother who always agree to the requests and demands of the kids who are good, great mothers. But, you know, I want to talk to you about mothers who said yes to the will of God. Mothers who said yes to the call of God. I would like to offer to you that these are the mothers that really sets the tone of humanity. And if you look in the Bible, it is filled with the story of mothers who despite their circumstances, who despite their challenges, who despite the opposition they're mounting against her, but decided to say yes to the call of God, decided to say yes to the invitation of God. So Mother's Day in the U.S., I don't know about the rest of the world, but it begins, you know, with a, 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 a person by the name of Anna Jarvis in 1905. She began to rally up for the cause of mothers, and she began to... Um, in, in remembrance of her own mother who died caring for uh, Civil War uh, victims, um, asked that a special day be reserved to, to remember the sacrifices of mother. So it was so fittingly, the first Mother's Day was uh, celebrated in 1908 in a church. You know, it's a church, it's a Methodist church in Grafton, West Virginia. And... Uh, thank God that President Woodrow Wilson in 1914 signed into uh, the law, you know, declaring that Mother's Day, the second Sunday of May, to be the Mother's Day, to be a special day of serve to remember the sacrifice and the, you know, the the the, the service that the, the the service that our mothers have provided for us. Amen. So you know, when you, I, I want to, 
As somebody who has grown up from being a child to being a parent, I can testify to you that many times you won't understand the true values that your moms or maybe your parents, but today we're, we're, we're honoring our mothers, that they provide until you have kids of your own. All right? So maybe when you are at the age of four, the sentiment that goes around was, oh, my mom can do anything, super mom, right? By the time you're age 12, you begin to realize, you know, teenagers, you know, you, you think you know everything, you know the world, you know, you know better, a little bit better than your mom. Oh, mom doesn't know everything, you realize. You come with the realization, mom doesn't know everything. By the age 14, you realize that mom doesn't know anything. <laughs> 14, you know. Oh, okay. At the age 18, you know, most of them would say mom is so out of step, out of style with the times. Mom was so backwards. Well, at least not the 18 years old in our church maybe. Hopefully not, all right? At the age 25, then you begin to slowly realize, uh, apparently mom knows a little thing about life that I did not know. At the age of 35, Maybe before we make a decision, let us find out what mom thinks about it. <laughs> 35, senses begin to come back. At the age 45, at this time, maybe most of us, our mom is no longer with us. And you begin to wonder, I wonder what my mom would say about this. And by the time you reach the age 65, you know, the popular sentiment is, I wish I could talk to my mom just one more time. Now, um, there are those who live by the hindsight, you know, <laughs> uh, wishing that, oh, you know, had I knew this, I would have acted differently. Now, I want to encourage you, if you still have your mom around, don't ever take, a, take, you know, take them for granted. You know, don't wait until you reach 65. To, to say, oh, you know, I wish I could talk to my mom just one more time. But do it now. Appreciate them now. Because you'll realize in the end that they do know more about life than you do. They may not share the same fashion style with you. But, you know, they are a gift from God to you. You know, bless their heart. So I want to encourage you, don't, don't, don't take them for granted, you know. So call your mom if they're not here. You know, I, I am mindful. I know that some of us, you know, our moms are no longer here, but we know that, you know, their memory will always live in our heart. And let's continue to carry their legacy by living the faith that they have so faithfully planted within our life. Amen? So, you know, I, I picked this title because not only we are observing Mother's Day, but I am very aware that as we talk about answering God's call and how the power of answering God's call, the power of what it's like living a life answering God's call, you know, I realize that in the Bible there are so many stories about the power of God that flows in the life of a mother who said yes to God and how many histories in the Bible are shaped by the simple obedience, divide adversity by mothers who said yes to the will of God. So that's why I said mothers who said yes. Let's begin with this first one. I want to uh, encourage you to open 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 to 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 to 7. <clears throat> I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. It's about two mothers, Lois and Eunice. Uh, two, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God... According to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. Verse 5. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which is first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, 
which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and discipline. Amen. So this letter was written by Paul to his spiritual son, Timothy, who was a young pastor at that time. And maybe the fact that Paul was writing the letter in such a way, maybe it was because in response to, Paul, to, to the young pastor's, you know, um, discouragement of being a young pastor in such a great and thriving cities. And Paul being a great father, he reminded, he reminded Timothy of where he came from. This is so great and so powerful. You know, many times as I was, uh, as my kids were saying goodbye because they're going with, with their friends, I always reminded, re- reminded them, be good, remember who you are. Because that's part of your identity. That's part of your identity. And in the midst of this world, many times, you know, we can be so blend in into the world to the degree that we forgot who we are, where we came from, the legacy that was planted within us, who we are. And I've, I'm a firm believer that there is power in realizing who you are. There's power in realizing full wear with clarity of your identity, your God-given identity. And the fact that you are not, you, 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 you did not come into, accident, into existence by accident, but you are fearfully and wonderfully designed by God. Remember who you are. And Paul began to encourage his spiritual son by reminding Timothy of the spiritual legacy spiritual heritage that he came from. And verse 5, he says, For I am mindful. What it it means is that I am fully aware of this fact about you. Verse 5, the sincere faith within you, which is first, look at this, first dwell in where? Your grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice. So Timothy is the... The third layer of that faith legacy, faith heritage. Thank God for mothers and grandmothers who said yes to God, who said yes to the will of God, who who said yes to His guidance, and who in doing so, carry it into practice in how they disciple, they nurture their kids. And... You know, as a result, we are where we are now because of that heritage. You know, my family was not a Christian to begin with, at least not a practicing one. But early in my life, you know, we, we, were, we were all converted by the power of God. And I'm grateful for my parents, which are here this morning. It's a special treat because for the first time, we, I get to celebrate Mother's Day with my mom here in, in, in my presence I'm a bit shaky in my sermon (laughs) because it's very intimidating to preach before her, you know. And, and, you know, but I'm grateful. I am who I am because of the fact that my parents, my mom, she's a praying mom. And, you know, she would be mad at so many things, but she would be furious if I did not, you know, glorify God in my life. If I made poor choice that, you know, brings shame to the name of God. So... The same way, the the way Paul encouraged Timothy is by reminding him, remember, you were born from the heritage of strong women in your life. The faith that first in your grandmother. And to me, it's very interesting and such an honor because so many people have misunderstood, the world has misunderstood women. You know, the corporate world has misunderstood women as one of a lesser, you know, creation by giving them lesser, you know, uh, wage and everything, you know, and we have, you know, our share men in in, in dishonoring women as an equal counterpart in our life. But if you look at the Bible, I'm grateful for the Bible who place women in such honor, who, who, who really, you know, place them in such honor. And if you look, the more you study the Bible, the more you will see how God used great women. Not just men of God, but great women. And I'm very encouraged the way how, how Paul encouraged Timothy in his uh, discouragement by bringing this fact. Timothy, what you have now is not, your, it's not there because just one day you decided you, you need God. But it is something that has been carefully nurtured and planted since the time of your grandmother to your mom and finally to you. It is a heritage it is not just a sentiment, but it is a heritage. 
And you know what? We need more heritage of, we need more great godly women that will pass on such heritage. We need more grandmas like this. We need more mothers like this who would say yes to God. And you know what? In turn, pass it on to their children and to their children's children. And as a result, we know that Timothy becomes a great pastor, not just because of Paul's discipleship, but because to start off, he came off with a great foundation that was laid down by great women of God who said yes to God. Ladies, I want to challenge you to live up to that standard. I want to challenge you to live up to that legacy that one day your kids will become the beneficiary of your devotion to God. Beauty is great. You know, intelligence is great. But without the fear of the Lord, the Bible says it is nothing. It is nothing. It is nothing. You can, you, can, you can accumulate so much, but you will not carry it to you to eternal life. But the Bible says, deposit wealth in heaven. And how you do that is by making sure, by securing, by making sure that your generation, your children, and your children's children will carry on your faith. Man, this is a good criteria to look for in a woman if you're looking for a wife. Don't just be consumed by beauty, which will fade. Hello? You know, just wait in the morning when she walks up. I mean, you know, the glory will fade. The mascara will run off. Perfume will wear off. Believe me, just wait until she begins to do the chores in the house. Trust me, respectfully, you know, I love my wife. But we all know if that's what you are anchoring on your love and commitment, you are in for a great disappointment. You are in for a great disappointment. But when you share your common unity in how you value God, His call upon your life, and how he, how she said yes to God. And you know what? You're in for a great adventure of life in your marriage, in your relationship. I want to challenge you, both of you, men and women, ladies and gentlemen in this room, think about it. I mean, maybe we will not be written in the Bible, but for sure, that legacy of you, ladies, will be written in the book of life. That is even better. Your children will become become the recipient of the great legacy. We need more ladies who will say yes to the will of God instead of the pressure of the world. Amen? So what a great legacy it is that was passed on by these two great mothers, grandmothers and mom, Lois and Eunice, you know, that we've seen in the life of this young pastor named Timothy. You know, um, what we need is more godly mothers, mothers who say yes to God, praying mothers, you know, politicians will not change the world, but, you know, godly mothers, praying mothers will. I'd like to quote our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, who says that no one is poor who has a godly mother. No one is poor who has a godly mother. You know, do you want to have a, 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 a blessed descendant? Ladies, mom, start becoming a praying mom. Pray for the will of God to be in reality for the, for the life of your kids. Amen? You know, and, and, and the more I understand this, and I am asking this, I am fully aware of the charge that I just gave because it's not an easy charge. You know, being a mother alone is difficult. How many of you agree in that? Amen? Let alone having to carry the legacy of God. But we know that by the grace of God. Amen? Being the, you know, like I said, sometimes, you know, when you are, uh, still a single person living under the care of your mom, you would complain, oh, mom, you're too sick. Oh, you are too this, you're too that. You know, it's, we, we have a lot to complain, but, you know, nothing to thank. <laughs> but the minute you start becoming a parent, believe me, <laughs> you start realizing that, wow. You, know, you start appreciating the service that your parents, you know, provided. I remember a story about a mom who was pushing her shopping cart in, a, in you know, a fine store named Walmart. So she carries her little girl on the cart who wouldn't stop screaming and kicking and yelling and, you know, just throwing tantrum the whole time, you know, 
All the while, the mother was trying to shop and push the cart. And the mother was heard saying out loud, Now calm down, Ellen. It'll be all right, Ellen. It's almost time to go home, Ellen. So one of the Walmart female clerk took notice and then said to the woman, Ma'am, you are to be commended at how patient you are with little Ellen here. And then the lady turned to her and said, Ma'am, I am Ellen. <laughs> Calm down, Ellen. It'll be all right, Ellen. It's time. It's almost time to go home and then I can beat up my little angel. No, just kidding. I am Ellen. Believe me when I say, it's not easy being a mom. You know, it's not easy being a mom. I'm grateful for my mom who did not strangle me when I was little, when she can, when she still can. But I'm grateful for my mom who, you know, despite my mischief and everything, continued to, you know, lovingly educate me and teach me in the way of God. Let's go to the second mom. We have three moms, so this is the second one. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 26, verse 59. Any Ellen here? I'm sorry, Ellen. It'll be all right, Ellen. It's almost done, Ellen. Pastor, I'm Ellen. <laughs> Numbers chapter, uh, oh, I think that's a, that's a, yeah. Numbers, cha- Numbers chapter 26, verse 59, sorry. Numbers chapter 26, verse 59. Okay, this is the second mom that I want you to know. Jochebed, you know, Jochebed, I don't know how you say it. So the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. So she's a Levite. And she bore to Amram, Aaron, and Moses, and Miriam, and their sister. So Jochebed is Moses' mom, right? So Exodus chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, tells you of the story of Moses. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. You know, Levite being, you know, a special tribe that was designed for the care of the temple, for the work, uh, for the uh, worship in the temple. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that she, he was with a, a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and, pe- and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know w- what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. And when she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister Miriam uh, said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. You know, we know that in the Old Testament, Moses is a type of Jesus. It's a symbol, it's a, you know, The Old Testament uh, uh, sign of Jesus, the Old Testament version that depicts Jesus who will bring his people out of the darkness. So it's to me it's very interesting that the way God chose to 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 the person that shall you know give way to the salvation of his people, the Jews, is by way of a simple obedience of a woman. So we know the story how when the famine took place, Joseph was pre predestined by God to be inserted deep as a second right hand man of Pharaoh in, in Egypt. And as a result, all his fathers, his relative, everything, they, they moved to Egypt. But then again, as the old Pharaoh who knew Joseph well died, the new Pharaoh was put in place and who knew nothing about Joseph or his people. So, you know, the, the Israelites went from a very welcome guest, honorable guest, to become enslaved alien and feared slave. So what happened was the new Pharaoh instituted a law that 
No, um, no Jewish uh, son were ever to be birthed in Egypt. You know, so it was forbidden to have a, 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 a Jew son. So if, if a woman gave birth to a son, you know, it was commanded to be killed right away. If you remember the story at the birth of Jesus, it is similar. There was murder of, you know, um, uh, babies, baby, baby boys during his time. So what happened was this mom, Jochebed, bravely defied. Bravely defied the will of Pharaoh. And we know that because she was born from the tribe of Levi. So she is a devout tribe. She knows, she knows about the word of God. She knows about the will of God. She knows about the promise of the Messiah. So I'd like to offer to you that this is a simple mom who did not uh, things. Uh, an, an ordinary mom who did extraordinary things by bravely saving his son. Namely Moses. And look at the way he, she did it. She tried to, uh, it's, it's difficult to conceal your pregnancy, you know. It's difficult. And when you gave birth, she hid it for three months. And we know that newborn baby is so difficult to, to be cared for. You know, it will, as if continuously, you know, every one minute or five minutes will cry. It's, it's difficult. And then as a slave in Egypt under constant scrutiny, it's not very easy to, 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 to uh, conceal a, a baby boy. But she did it for three months until she could not do it any longer. You know what she did? Now, this is, when I read this, you know, I, I, was, I, I was reminded of, you know, a marketing term, product placement. <laughs> so she cleverly put it in a, 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 a basket that has been uh, put a special seal to make it uh, watertight. And put it by the bank of the river. And she knew where this river is flowing. And I know that she was not just gambling with it. I know she planned this purposefully because she also asked the sister to watch it. And she knew that this water will flow all the way to the compound of the Pharaoh's daughter. So if you know, they will not see the plight of the Jew, then we'll bring the plight to them. So that they will see what's going on. You guys are murdering our babies every day. So that's what happened. She put it there. It took guts to do this, you know. But more than that, I believe she's doing it because she trusts God full well, the God that he has, she has served, you know. So when this is, this is why it's not just enough for you to just have a good education, good skill, but you need to have faith in something greater than you. And what's more important, you need to have faith in the word of God. You need to know the word of God. You need to know the promise of God. And when you say yes to his word, to his promise, let me tell you something. He's going to bring, God is going to bring to pass his promise to you. God is faithful. He will not deny you of his promise. So that's what happened. I am so amazed at this ordinary mom who did extraordinary thing in such an uh, oppressing time. You know, how many of you understand that having a kid is a blessing from God? Hello? And we're living in a time where this notion is attack. You know, people are so quick at just dismissing these issues because of inconvenience. We know that our nation is at the brink of division like in a historical proportion because of the, re, the, the, the prospect of reversal of Roe versus Wade, you know. I'm not being political here, but I'm just telling you the truth. But you know what? We look in the stories of the Bible how so many times history was being created by ordinary women who choose to do extraordinary choices even when it is inconvenient, even at the time where it is the most inconvenient to her. And to think that we would just dismiss a life just like that, it hurts me. It hurts the word of God. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I can't help but to, to speak up on this. A life is precious. We don't own it. And if we are blessed with a life, it is not for us to make a statement. But it is for us to say yes to him and to glorify him. So, 
You will see in the Bible. The next mother that we will cover also is pressed with such inconvenience in the care of a baby. But in the midst of that, she chose to say yes to God. So this is Jochebed, and we know that as a result of her persistence, of her simple but stubborn faith, she saved the Jews. Let's go, let's go to the next mother. Matthew chapter 1, verse 16, and Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. We're going to talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, in, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 16, if you look at Matthew chapter 1, you will see Jesus' lineage being, you know, step by step. This becomes the father of this, this becomes the father of this, this becomes the father of this, all the way to the father of Joseph, which is the husband of Mary. But what is interesting is that in this passage, in Matthew 1, verse 16, it says that Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and it says Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. It's never before. On the previous verses before, it was never addressed the mother. It's always the father. But I believe this is a special place that was reserved to honor her. To honor Mary. To honor, you know, mothers. You know, Mary was the mother of Jesus who is called the Messiah. And let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. You know, not Christmas yet, but it's always useful to... Look at this. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38 is when, is when Gabriel was, Mary's first encounter with Gabriel being given the message of God that she is to be, uh, 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 she is to be expecting the, a baby that is to be the Messiah. Verse 28, he came to her and said, Gabriel came to her and said, Greeting of favor one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and this tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. You know, what I like about this story, it is not using a screen to, you know, obscure or conceal Mary's true, true feeling or, or her humanity. Because she was also filled with doubts. She was also filled with questions. But we can know at the end is that she's not doubtful of the goodness of God. You can, you can, you can, you can have you know, you can have that. You can have doubts, but don't ever question the sovereignty of God in your life. You know, so that's what happened. And the angel said, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Fast forward, verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? I've never known any man before. She never slept with any man before. She was not married. She was still in betrothal uh, stage. And then the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has, been, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month of her who is called barren. She has been six months pregnant. And Mary said, look at this, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Wow. You know, it was estimated that at this time, you know, she was at the prime, not too old. In our standard, still teenager maybe, 14, 15. But at the time, in the, in the, in the age at that time, it is a, 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 betrothal, a betrothal age. So very young. Living in a very, <laughs> a culture that is not favorable to Women and also especially to uh, women who are unmarried but pregnant, of course. The only alternative will be that you will be stoned to death. If, if, if the God himself would show up to you, ladies, and say, oh, you know what? God is, has found favor to you, so you will be pregnant. You're not married yet. but you Imagine what your response will be. You know? Imagine the, 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 the panic will be, you know. Just, I'm just trying to bring this whole perspective as real as possible to us. So what I want you to know of all these three ladies and so many others in the Bible is that the fact that what's the same between them and us is that we do have a choice. We do have a choice. But what sets us apart with them is the fact that they choose to say yes to God. So there's a challenge, ladies. There's a challenge, guys. All of us. I, this is not just a sermon about ladies. 
But this is for all of us. And in fact, today, men, we should learn from the women of the Bible who said yes to God. The mothers of the Bible who said yes to God. What is the same to all of us is that we will have choices. We will be presented with alternatives in our life. But what will set us apart is what will we do about it? How will we choose to respond to the choice that was given to us? Are we going to choose to play it safe for us? Are we going to choose to, you know, I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. So I'm going to do what makes sense to me. Well, there, you're gonna, there it is. You're going to have a problem always because when you talk about God, God does not think the way that you do. God does not see what you see. God does not walk where you walk. Yeah, I mean, he, he has his own way. And what he wants is for you to trust in him. He does not always reveal everything, but he wants you to trust him because he is a good God. So if you always make decisions based on, oh, it's not, it doesn't make any sense to me. The idea of God itself should be challenged then in you. Have you seen God? Have you met him? But there's no denying that you've lived long enough to become the recipient of the goodness of God. You don't deny that. Why deny him now when he asks you to make the tough choices? But we all know that it is the tough choices that always resulted in us going forward, going upward. No one grew in their comfort, but when they are forced to be this comforted to be inconvenient because of a choice, that's when they grow the most. And God would want you to grow even though it is discomfort, inconvenient, but when you are answering his call, take notice, you're going to grow like you've never grown before, you're going to be fruitful like you've never fruitful, be fruitful before. And for so many of us, we're going to shape history. We're going to change history. Just like all these simple mothers. Today we honor them. Because of what they have done, history was determined. Because of what they have done. You can't be a Christian and not see. You can't be a Bible reader and miss this. We honor them. So many of the will of God as it's written in the Bible was do so through the simple obedience of a godly mother who say yes to God. Who say yes to his will. So ladies, I want to encourage you. Mom, I want to encourage you today. You play no small parts. You play no small parts. Because of you, generations will continue to serve him, will continue to change the world because of your obedience. Don't ever let your guard down because you are the boundaries of this nation. You, you are really the voice of conscience that this nation is so longing, you know. And, and you all share the same plight in, like this ladies in, in, in the Bible, many of them have great problems. Great mothers have great problems. They do. Many of them are persecuted. Many of them are barren to begin with. They are uh, 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 treated harshly by their you know, other wives or uh, uh, the in-laws. Um, so many elements. Hello? You, you got to understand that marriage life back then is not that much different than now. They all have shared great problems. Great mothers have great problems. But we also understand that great mothers, they make great plans. You know, they make great plans. They plan to follow the word of God. They plan to be faithful. You know, in the story of 1 Samuel about a barren lady named, a barren mom named Hannah, if you remember the story, Hannah pledged to God. And she said, Lord, if you will give me a son, I will forever dedicate this son for you. And this son will never know scissors, will never know uh, his hair, will never know scissors. That's a Nazarite foul, a, a person whose life fully dedicated to God. Make great plans. And what we know also about this mother is that great mothers always, they keep great priorities. And their priorities are always straight to God. We know that. You know, Hannah, in, 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 in her barrenness, she was ridiculed by the other wife, Penina. And the, 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 the husband also insensitively say, Hannah, why are you sad? Am I not better than ten sons? 
You know, it's like saying, Hannah, please don't be sad because you don't have son. You have me. I was like, hello, Elkanah, you need, you know, a manhood seminar. <laughs> you know, but you look at 1 Samuel, not once does Hannah attack Elkanah and bear toward him. It is because of you. Give me a son or I shall die, just like Rachel. Or she, she never retaliated to, to Penina, the other wife. She did not, she did not even, she was not angry against God. But she poured herself. It was written, she prayed to the Lord. She continued praying before the Lord. She poured out her soul before the Lord. This tells me that this great mother who has great problems have great priorities. Instead of worrying, instead of channeling her anger and disappointment to other people or circumstances of blaming God, is that she pour out her heart to God. And as a result, we know. As a result, we know. that God answered her prayer. You know, we're grateful for the mothers, the great mothers that we have in our life. Amen? Come on, let's do it. One more round of applause for our mothers. You know, I, I, I am myself is a recipient of such a great service of our great mother. First is the mother of my kids, my wife, you know, uh, she is looking at me with such anger look because she doesn't like to be in the attention of my sermon. <laughs> but honey, I want to say thank you to you. She's not born in a Christian family. But when she, we dated and when we were getting close to marriage, I told her, are you sure you want to marry me? I'm going to be a pastor. And she said, yes. I mean, some of you are thinking about what you are going to wear and didn't go to church because you don't like the outfit or you don't like the weather. She has to choose because she is born from a family who does not share the same belief with us. She has been through persecution. And even when we were apart, she chose to remain faithful to God. And, and I just, if you would just indulge me, you know, I, I would like to honor the mother of my kids. Because she chose to say yes to God when it is inconvenient. You know, I mean... It's, it's, it's romantic that we got married. Okay, let's move to Boston. Whoa, yeah. No money. $700 to our name. Not making it up. The first week I slept at, you know, one of our members' sofa. She slept at the girl's sofa. But she said yes to God before she said yes to me. And because of that, when it comes to our kids, it's not a problem for her to say yes to the will of God for our kids. I want to thank you, honey, for your obedience to the word of God. And if, <laughs> so many times we don't know where the next payment going to be coming from. But, you know, she made great plans and she stick by it. If, if I, we don't have to, I don't have to eat this and that so that our kids can have the opportunity or, you know, we can go on in the ministry. You know, it's not too much for her. It's not too difficult. And I would like to honor my mom also because she's here. <laughs> you know, I, I would, I'm grateful for a mother who is a praying mother. Praying mother. I don't know what I'd do without her. You know, she said yes to God. You know, she was also not born from a family that, that loves God. In fact, she paid a dear price, just like my wife, when they said yes to God. Most of us were born in a Christian family. Two of the greatest women in my life, no, they're not born in a Christian family. They pay a dear price. But when they say yes to God, the rest becomes history. And she stick by my dad for... 125 years? <laughs> At least it feels like that. <laughs> 58 years or something. And, you know, not always goofy together. There are times that they're Tom and Jerry, but she stick by my dad. And she's a prayer warrior. She doesn't just pray for me and my wife and all the other kids and the grandchildren, but she prayed for this church. Every time I call her, she always say, oh, how was Indra? How was Jean? How was Michael? What about me, mom? <laughs> <laughs> I'm your son here. Hello. Ah, yeah. I prayed for you, but 
I pray for them. So, you know, I'm at the stage where I say, where I think, what would my mom think about this? <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm not 65 yet, but I know enough to say that. You know, I'm, I'm grateful that in this church we're surrounded by great moms who said yes to God. When I look at my good friend, the Sugiantos, I look at Susanti, oh, wow. She stuck by us, this church, and me and my wife. You know, there were times when it's not fun to be around us. But <laughs> we're still here. I mean, I know her back when every night she would change the bed sheets because of a certain condition of the kids. And, and you know what? Thank God for moms who said yes to God, who did not neglect to disciple the children in the way of the Lord, you know. Get to be surrounded to the like of Selfie. Where's Selfie? Is he taking a selfie in the back? <laughs> selfie. Every single story of this mom, I knew their story. I knew their life. Melia and many other, Bernice. I am so grateful that this church is built on the faith of mothers. Uh, Angel, where's Angel? And then there's... Uh, Emily, so many moms. I'd like to honor also Pastor Jane, Pastor Ron's wife in, in Rochester. She was working, handling, you know, managing three uh, pharmacy in Indonesia, doing very well. I mean, Pastor Ron wouldn't mind me saying this, but, you know, compared to her salary, Pastor Ron, <laughs> as a pastor. But when God shared the vision for Rochester, the first thing that Pastor Ron did was ask the wife, and the wife would say, I, I, I believe in the call of God that he has placed upon you. Saying yes to God, even though it's not easy, even though it's costly. Where would we be without great mothers who chose to say yes, even when it's inconvenient to be saying so? Ladies, we honor you. Mom, we honor you. I mean, I know that we have some moms in this place as well. We honor you. Come on, let's give it up to them. But I think the take-home story for all of us now, we too can make history, you know, when we say yes to his call upon our life. And today we learn from such a great example of our moms. May God bless them all. Amen. Father, we thank you for such a blessing that you have given to all of us. Father, I'm so grateful that you give to this church and to our life great mothers who are not afraid to say yes to you. And because they say yes to you, we are where we are right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray that you bless our mothers. Bless our wife. Bless our mothers as they have continually, oh God, honor you and chose to disciple us by way of honoring you. Making decisions that put you first before everything else. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for such a legacy. May we someday share the same glory like Timothy who says that such faith in you is also seen from your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. Father, we pray that what we have right now, we will pass on to our children, to their children, and to their children's children. That because of our simple obedience today, a generation that will continue to honor you, will continue to walk in this planet, will continue to be birthed from this church. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless all of our mothers today. And may we never forget the lessons they taught us to say yes to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.